Some of the discussion this morning in the Sunday school class uh, touched on some of the things that uh, I plan to look at this morning. The, uh, this is not a surprise. This is kind of a, of a closed circuit. And we've got some pamphlets that talk about the big five because the gospel isn't really super complex. So we end up talking about the same things frequently. The topic this morning that I selected is wages versus gifts. And I don't know if I have I do, apparently. I wanted to start with this text. Some of you probably guessed that that would be the text we'd tie to that title. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? And Paul is referring to the reader's previous walk of life in the world. The things whereof ye are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Why is Jesus called Lord? Well, because he has been exalted by his God and our God to a position of authority and held up as a perfect example and sacrificed for our sins. As we've mentioned before, he has a lot of hats. There's a lot of God's promises, and there's a lot of God's plan, and the, the working of God's plan that falls on Jesus. But there's a contrast here between wages and gifts. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about that this morning. One of the uh, team class talked about the fruits of the Spirit. Immediately preceding that is the works of the flesh. So these are works for which the wages are death. The works of the flesh are manifest or they're obvious. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God by virtue of death. That's why they won't inherit. So in Revelation 22 and 21, where you read that outside of the city are these sinful people, that doesn't mean that they're standing outside. It means that they're left out. They're not in the city. How many of these that are listed, these works of the flesh, remind you of headlines that you see virtually every day? And hot topic debates in our civilization. What is the main cause of abortion? It isn't a happily married couple. There's a lot of adultery and fornication that's involved in that. So 
So why are people fighting so hard for it? Because they want their adultery and fornication. Uncleanness is a pretty big ca category. I mean, you can lump a lot of stuff into some of these things. But hatred, strife, murders, envying, just all kinds of fairly normal human emotions, but they're emotions that, and they're, they're, they're behaviors that in the first passage that we read are supposed to be left behind, or you'll get the wages, which is not inheriting the kingdom of God. 1 John 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I am a sinner, and I need to admit that, and I need to adopt the humility that should come from that knowledge. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I would submit that that's a gift. It's not something we really deserve. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank God. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Fairly serious. In Hebrews 10, verses 22 through 24, it says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The necessity of baptism isn't our topic this morning, but that's certainly inserted into this thought process. Because we are all sinners, it is essential that we be forgiven because we've earned death. It's easy for us to visualize death as a just punishment for the things that we feel most emotional about and, and seem the most heinous. But we need to get our head around God's perspective that a lot of the things that we feel are less important aren't less important. And there's a number of things that, that God has condemned that may not strike an emotional chord with us by nature, but we need to train ourselves to, at the very least, comprehend that it's bad, and by doing that, we will get to the point that we emotionally connect with this being bad. It's, as an example, lying is a fairly natural thing, and you see kids doing it from the time that they're little. But we can certainly come to grasp how hurtful lies are when it happens to us, when some kind of lie causes us pain. God feels that lying is one of the things he hates, and that's just an example. We need to work on our spirits so that they match God's spirit in his hatred and abhorrence of all kinds of sin. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. He's faithful to provide the gifts that he's promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love. And some of the classes this morning spent a lot of time on that word. <laughs> 
it's a big topic and it's it's kind of all inclusive as far as uh putting on a new person becoming a different identity to provoke unto love and to good works and we'll talk a little bit more about works later uh oh i've lost it what are god's gifts Paul, in his sermon on Mars Hill, said, God that made the world and all things therein. Okay, we could stop there. <laughs> That's a big gift. It's, it's amazing. I mean, we love to travel. We love to see new places. We love great weather. There's just all kinds of things that are very appealing about God's creation. And he's promised that the reward of the righteous will be better than this. That this is a cursed environment. So you may go to a really nice place and get sick. Because the curse is still there. And it's not as fun to be at a really nice place when you're sick. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth. So, subtle hint here, these are gifts. To all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood, not necessarily the same color, person, but all one blood, all nations of men, to dwell on all the face of the, of the earth, excuse me, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. In the adult Sunday school, we talked a little bit about the creation and man's arrogance and believing they can figure it out. But ironically, the more they learn, the more they find they don't know. And some of the things that they've discovered really caused them to question and it brings about that very famous phrase. We used to think, but now we know that da 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 da. And in 10 years, they'll be saying the same thing about the thing they now know. It's a, it's evolution. <laughs> Science is evolving. That's what's going on. So God made the universe, people, all of the information, not just how the body develops, which they can't figure that out. They, they're learning things, but they're finding that there's more that they don't know. And all of the instincts that drive humans, animals. And it's this, that's one of the biggest puzzles for science is how does the information get there and how does it get stored and passed on? They understand some of it, but the more they learn, the more they find out they don't know. And God has determined the times before appointed. What do you think that means? We're going to have a history class and then following that, there will be a prophecy class. The prophecy class explains what was appointed by God to happen. The history class explains how that happens. So the thought process is learn the history and then look at the prophecies and understand how God appointed the times and the bounds of people's habitations. And his purpose here is that they should seek the Lord. If happily, they might feel after him, 
grope after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. We mentioned repeatedly that the Bible is the most common book on the planet. There isn't any country that has never heard of this Jesus of Nazareth guy. A lot of the wars worldwide have been fought over that being or misunderstandings of that being or conflicts between different beliefs. He isn't far. And many of the principles of science, especially trying to define what can be counted as science, begin with the premise that can't be God. <laughs> so it isn't that there's ignorance. Uh-oh, mic drop. <laughs> it isn't that there's ignorance of God. He isn't far. There's just resistance. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now, current civilization is really fighting against that concept. But history is full of the awareness of God. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a nation that's dedicated to the principle that all men are created equal. And I didn't quote that perfectly, but everybody recognizes who that is. Everybody recognizes that that was a very, very common thought process. It was wide, widely accepted that we've got a creator. That's not popular anymore. Thank you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here's another gift. That whoever believes in him. Now that's another work. Faith is a work. There is a distinction between faith and works, but faith in and of itself is an action. It's mental. It's something that is a choice, but it's, it's an evidence of something to God. It's evidence of things not seen. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So Jesus is a gift. And I try to express appreciation for that gift regularly. He's a gift as his sacrifice for sin. He's a gift as a teacher. He's a gift as a perfect example. He's a gift as a future just king. So there's lots of elements to that. In 2 Peter 1, Peter writes, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God 
and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. There's a gift. God's provided the information that we need for life and godliness. Interestingly enough, included in this are examples of God denying some information. Don't write that, Daniel. Don't write that, Ezekiel. Don't write that, John. Why? Because we've got enough. And to test, to make it a challenge. God's got a purpose for all of this. There's a reason he made the universe and he created all the creatures, including mankind. And then he set the bounds of their habitation and the times and what was going to happen, his whole plan. And he made it hard on purpose, but he made it doable on purpose. And Jesus came, Jesus said, I came to bring a sword, but he also came to bring peace. And we have to get our head around, uh, w w that seems contradictory, so what does it mean? Well, his coming and his doctrine, which he was commanded to teach by his God, is divisive. And the formula that some of the classes talked about, the many and the few, is a crucial thing to get our head around and to, to grasp. That God designed this whole system so that he could give amazing gifts to the few who will love and obey him. Does God take any pleasure in the destruction of the wicked? No. He, he would love everyone to accept, but he knows that they won't. That only a few will accept. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, and then verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Yeah, there are some amazing promises that God has made. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. So through the knowledge that God has provided, through his son and through the prophets, we can become like God, divine in that sense. We might be partakers of the divine nature, having a nature like God's, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So the education process of learning what God hates, what God loves, helps us to become a being that he can love by escaping the lust that's in the world. Now, built into this also is escaping from corruption, the mortality and death process, that's a big escape. Eternal life is a huge component of God's gifts. So there's 
spiritual corruption that we can escape by understanding God's nature and understanding Christ's teachings and following his example. And there's mortality that we can escape by God giving that to those that separate themselves from worldly behavior. In Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, we read about the faithful. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. They hadn't actually acquired the gift that God is offering, or the gifts. But having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Not that they're citizens of any given country. Not that they're members of any political party within any of those countries. But that they're strangers and pilgrims. Sojourners. And that's what we have to come to understand, that as a child of God, we honor whatever government we find ourselves in. But we're not of that. We're strangers and pilgrims. We are citizens of a future monarchy. And that's to be our focus. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they'd been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly country. Like heaven, ordered from heaven, ordained by heaven. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Another one of God's gifts. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle, or the dwelling place, the tent, of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Sadly, most of the gospels that are being preached have this backward. The truth is, heaven's going to be empty. God's coming here. And the righteous will dwell on the earth with him. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. 2 Corinthians 6 says, Sons and daughters. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Another gift to look forward to. There shall be no more death. We've talked about that one, but that's another present with a bow. Neither sorrow nor crying Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And this is part of how we know that the fire of judgment won't last beyond this point. Because there's no more pain. There's no more death. There's no more suffering at all. But this is a very comprehensive and very exciting gift. How important are works? In Exodus 32, it's recorded, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, 
ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto Jehovah. Peradventure I shall make atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto Jehovah and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And Jehovah said to Moses, Whoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. This is a little bit small, but it gives you an idea of how many different references talk about this book. Philippians 4.3, Yea, I beseech thee also, true yoke fellow, help these women, for they labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. In Revelation 3.5, Jesus said, He that overcometh shall thus be arrayed in white garments, and I will in no wise blot his name out of the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. In Revelation 13, 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life. This is talking about the beast. Those that dwell on the earth will worship the beast, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition, and those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not, and yet is. I'm not going to explain that one right now, but it's just another example of in the book of life. Revelation 20, verse 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone found written in the book of life, anyone not found written, written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. And this is what I referred to in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 through 18. And what agreement does God's temple have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will live in them and walk among them. And I will be their people, and they will be my God. Therefore, come out from the midst of them, and that's sinful, unbelieving, excuse me, and be separate. And that's this sojourner, this pilgrim, this stranger category of citizen. To be separate, says the Lord, and stop touching anything unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be to you a father, and you will be to me sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So there's a stark contrast between the wages, what we earn, if we're not righteous, and the gifts of God. 
Let's conclude with a song. More like the master, number 117.